uh, work with a career group, um, with, with uh, Kang Jun Lee and Kwang Gyeong Kim. Um, and this dates back to a whole bunch of work to do with exceptional field theory. And then I'd done some other work on the double copy and realized that these two things can come together in quite an interesting way. So first I've got to give you some motivation and context for what exceptional field theory is. I'm taking it, most of the people in this audience know what the double copy is, or at least uh, as much as anyone knows what the double copy is, uh, are familiar with it, but perhaps less so what exceptional field theory is. <clears throat> so let me give a few minutes where I talk about that. So we're all used to the fact that in Kaluza Klein theory, you bring together gravity and electromagnetism into one single neat geometric package, i.e. five-dimensional gravity. And part of that is that the action and local symmetries of electromagnetism then emerge from a reduction from this one dimension higher. <clears throat> as such, we get used to seeing vector fields um, as part of geometry and as part of gravity. Now, everyone knows about Kaluza Klein. Um, but when we actually come to do something like string theory, we see that we have supergravities where we don't have vector fields so much, well, we do, but we also have in general these p-form potentials. At the very least, we've got this two-form potential, the NS and S2 form. And, you know, a very natural question, which you could have asked yourself if you know about Kaluza Klein theory, is, is there a theory in higher dimensions, such that when you dimensionally reduce it, like Kaluza Klein, you get the P form, or in particular, the two form theory of supergravity. Okay, that's the first question. Did anyone even think of that themselves? Who went, no, I'll happily uh, embrace the fact that when I write down the fields of string theory, I've got a metric, a two form, a mondo mon two forms, and they're all together. Uh, Kaluza Klein was brilliant. All of the fields come from one piece of geometry. Now, <clears throat> a quick answer is, which is why you've not heard about this question before, is that using ordinary geometry, you cannot obtain P form gauge potentials. Okay. So, I think that sort of stopped people from thinking about this for probably 30, 40 years, okay? But then uh, people through the root of string field theory came up with something called double field theory. And this does this job. It takes the whole NS and S sector of supergravity into a single purely geometric theory, okay? So it's a sort of Kaluza Klein theory that instead of unifying gravity in one forms, unifies gravity in two forms under reduction. And then the local symmetries, when you reduce, they're not just going to be diffeomorphisms, but they're going to be the diffeomorphisms combined with the gauge transformation of two forms. Okay. And what you want then <clears throat> is an action, an equations of motion that contain the usual supergravity equations once you remove the dependencies on the, the uh, extra dimensions. Well, so double field theory did that for, um, for the NS and S sector with just two forms. And along the way, I, I say geometric, it had to generalize the notion of geometry. Fortunately, that was done already by Nigel Hitchin. An exceptional field theory does this the even higher degree forms. So the three form of 11 dimensional supergravity or the full Ramond Ramond sector in string theory. Okay, so that's what exceptional field theory is. Um, and we'll come back to it and give you some equations. <clears throat> now, double copy. No doubt this audience knows double copy um, better than I do. Um, for the purposes of this discussion, Although double copy was originally formulated as a relation between scattering amplitudes, what I'm going to be interested in is this thing called the classical double copy, which focuses and uses in its construction the Kerr shield ansatz 
in general relativity and relates the fields in the Kerr shield ansatz to what you would take to be the bosonic fields in Yang Mills theory. Okay. When we come to it later, then <clears throat> we can discuss that some more. But if people don't like the words double copy, I can just say I'm generalizing the Kerr shield ansatz to supergravity. Okay, that would be the most honest thing. And then we can discuss to what extent the Kerr shield ansatz is classical double copy. And I think that's still open for some discussion. Okay. <clears throat> Let me go through the formalism then of double field theory first. So it's a novel formulation of string theory, which makes manifest an ODDR symmetry. Okay. And in doing so, it puts the metric and B field on equal footing. To make it work, you need to double the dimension of space time. So D will be the usual dimension of space time, say 10 or 26. Okay. But now you're going to double the dimension, but then equip that doubled space with an ODD structure. Um, so here I would have eta, which is an ODD uh, structure that then is globally defined, you require it's globally defined on that space. So we've extended the space, we put in a geometric structure on the space, and then we're gonna run with it. Okay. Um, the new coordinates, we've doubled it, so ordinary coordinates are x mu. The new novel coordinates are called x tilde, and they are normally have an index down for various reasons. There is this thing called the section condition, which says, given the fact I've now doubled the dimension of the space, <clears throat> how do I pick a D-dimensional submanifold in the 2D dimensional space that is actually the space time, the physical space time where we live? That section condition tells you how to pick it. Now, of course, it's not unique. It not being unique is actually what gives rise to duality in string theory. Okay. Um, and so this is stuff I've said already in words. Metric and B field go to something called uh, the generalized metric. Diffios and gauge transformations become generalized diffios on this doubled space that are generated by generalized Lie derivative. So we combine these coordinates into double coordinates. So big X with a capital index refers to a 2D dimensional space. And now let's actually get some meat of this. The generalized metric, which is this object, is then a combination of the ordinary metric in the B field. Now very rapidly, you see this has got fewer degrees of freedom than an arbitrary 2D dimensional metric. So what you actually demand is that this met generalized metric uses this ODD structure that you've put on the doubled space. So it's actually a representative of an ODD over OD cross OD coset. So this is a coset metric. And the remarkable fact is any coset metric of that ODD over OD cross OD can be parameterized by G and B as written here. So in other words, if I didn't know about the ordinary metric in the ordinary B field, and I just said, I'm on a doubled space with an ODD coset, you would write this down anyway, okay? And for technical reasons, we rescale the dilaton. So D is a rescale dilaton compared to the usual one. That's not such so important. We have an action in the 2D dimensional space and a generalized Ricci scalar. So this Ricci scalar is very similar to the Ricci scalar you would ordinarily write down, but the coefficients are slightly different. Now, and that's because this is generalized geometry, not classical Riemannian geometry, okay? Um, but this generalized Ricci scalar has all of the requisite local symmetries. If you don't, if you use the ordinary Riemannian Ricci scalar from Riemannian geometry, you will not get the right local symmetries, which is what's slow people down for years. So it's not good enough just to write this generalized metric. You then have to generalize the local symmetries and generalize all of geometry following. People did it. 
usefully. Now, <clears throat> we're then going to extend the same idea to M theory. Okay. And instead of making ODD manifest, which was a T-duality symmetry, we're going to make U-duality groups manifest. Now, U-duality groups depend very much on the dimension, but they're part of the exceptional group series. So, for example, in seven dimensions, you have E7, et cetera. Okay. Um, I've said include brain wrapping directions. Let's not discuss that. But the a number of dimensions that you need to add turns out to be more than doubling and is associated to when you're on a torus, how many ways a brain can wrap your space. To give some intuition, if I'm on a torus, a string can wrap a torus the same number of ways that there are dimensions to the torus. Was that clear? So the number of ways a string can wrap a torus is equal to the dimension of the torus. That's the best way to say it. The number of ways a membrane could wrap a torus is, is different. You just have to count the number of two cycles on a d-dimensional torus, okay, et cetera. So there's a more complicated relation about the dimensionality of these extended spaces in order to capture these U-duality groups. It won't be so important for us in what follows, perhaps. But we want to follow this picture of geometrically unifying the metric in C field. Okay, this is what I said about. Um, I want to give a specific example. SL5 um, is actually the same as E4. Um, so it's an exceptional group, but it's isomorphic to a, a non exceptional group, SL5. And this is the duality group for M theory in four dimensions. So I'm, I'm just going to do a specific instance where it's all manageable and a bit clear rather than go straight to E7 as something terrific. So I'm going to have X mu, which are the coordinates of four dimensions. I'm going to introduce six new dimensions, Y, which will be labeled with an anti-symmetric four. So mu nu run from one to four and are anti-symmetrized. That gives six. That's actually the number of ways a membrane could wrap a six dimensional torus. You bring these two things together, X mu and Y mu nu, that makes a 10 dimensional space. That 10 dimensional space is a representation of SL5. So this is what this says. Um, we have some generalized tangent vector, which is the 10 of SL5, parameterized by a four vector and a two form. And then you can, use the epsilon tensor in four dimensions to sort of raise this so that then the, this VMN indices is really then an honest 10 representation of SL5. <clears throat> okay, so that's like, that's giving us the tangent space of this extended space. And then the metric um, that we'll use will form an SL5 over SO5 coset and remarkably, it can be parameterized by this thing. And then we think of this thing as having the usual metric and the three form C field. Okay. I've probably gone a bit fast here through exceptional field theory. Are there any questions now? Anyone? No, no questions. Okay, let's keep on going. So even if you didn't know where any of this came from, this is a metric that contains an ordinary metric and a three form. Okay. So what you then want to do is write an action for it. So people have, and because we've only got, um, well, this is the, the extended space. We've got an additional seven dimensions going along for the ride, which would be ordinary geometry. Then we've, we write down the action for those as well. This is the equivalent of the generalized Ricci scalar for that metric M, curly M, which contain the metric in C field. So the point about it is it's a very well-defined thing that you can use. This is an action for this metric that will allow us through the equations of motion to get the equations of motion supergravity. Okay. Um, there is one 
caveat, which is very important in this game, normally to get the equations in motion, you've got to vary the action and then that gives you the equations in motion. Because these generalized metrics, this one, is the one gone, this one at the bottom are coset metrics, you can't vary the metric arbitrarily, you have to vary while keeping it in the coset form. Okay? If I vary the metric arbitrarily, it will take you out of this coset form. What that means in terms of obtaining equations of motion is that you vary the action, which is K, K is the variation of the action, but the equation of motion gets an additional projection given by P, which takes care of the fact that this is actually a coset representative. And P is given here, so we know what these things are, and alpha and omega and y depend on the specific details of the group. So I won't bore you with it. There's a universal structure for these projectors, and then depending on which group you want to do, that will change alpha and omega and y. Okay, but we've got the equations in motion. So the general story <clears throat> is all these generalized metrics, all exceptional field theories are given by this data. You form a, a representative of G over H forms a generalized metric. You have an action for it, and then alpha and omega determine the projectors, which give you the equations in motion. Okay, so this is just some list. The point is the data exists, it's there. If you're interested in a particular exceptional group, say E7, then you form an E7 over SU8 coset. The projector that gives you the equations in motion goes into here with that particular alpha and omega. Now, okay, all very quick. So let's get to what we want to use this for. So exceptional field theory is used for lots of things, but the, the case of interest for us here is that we want to use it to generalize the Kerr shield ansatz. Okay. So who knows what the Kerr shield ansatz is? Silence in the crowd. Um, this is the problem of giving Zoom talks versus in reality. If I was, if I was physically there, I'd be demanding you answer that question. Um, We've had a few talks already about, um, about classical double copy and Kerr shield ansatz. Brilliant. I'm happy. Good. So I don't need to motivate that too far. Um, so in the usual classical Kerr shield ansatz, this M will be your metric. This will be a background metric, usually taken to be flat space. And you would have two Ks, which are null vectors. And you'd have phi, a scalar field. Kappa here is containing things like the gravitational constant, and maybe some pi's. The thing that you would not normally have is this projector. So this projector is the same projector as this thing that was appearing in the equations in motion. Okay. But otherwise, this follows exactly the Kirchhoff ansatz and actually contains the classical ordinary Kirchhoff ansatz. So you require that K is null, which is this condition here. Um, and the key thing that you want actually is the second equation. What does its magic, the Kirchhoff ansatz, and this is why it was used for so many years, and why it was instrumental actually in finding the curved black hole, I know it's instrumental in finding the mayors Perry uh, solution, a whole host of other things, is that it linearizes general relativity. And it even linearizes straight away the metric inverse. So this metric inverse is an exact relation. Um, and to get that, you need the fact this is not. Now, it turns out to linearize the exceptional equations in motion, it's not quite sufficient just to have K to be null. You need to have this relation here. So if Q is this thing with P, K, K, you need Q squared to be zero. If Q squared is zero, then you will linearize the equations of motion with this ansatz, okay? And, and that's what you wanna do, because then you can solve things. So to do the sanity check, the projector for GR is trivial. It's just, the, it's just unity. This then becomes this, the, and then this is the usual conditions that you have on the usual 
Herschel van Zandt. And then what people do is then you've got to sub put this equation 14 into the Einstein equation. And then you show that Einstein's equations reduced to Maxwell's equations for phi k mu. If you identify a mu as the single copy of this gravitational solution, where you identify a mu as phi k mu. Okay, that's what people have done so far. So um, people like Donald and Chris White and Ricardo um, did this for a Schwarzschild black hole, in which case you get the a mu corresponding to a Coulomb charge, Taub nut, you'll get the magnetic solution corresponding to monopole. And, uh, and with Chris White, uh, we did it for even an instant. And uh, Gucci Hansen. So now the let's just try the next thing, which would be double field theory. So now we've got this metric, which contains G and B. We've got this ODD thing. Um, the Y tensor, which was part of that projector, is given by the product of the two eaters. These Js are actually eaters. Think of them as eaters. And then a remarkable thing happens just for the double field theory is that the projector actually splits up into two projectors defined here. And this is specific to double field theory and is a consequence of the left-right decomposition of the string. Okay. Um, so this is not a universal property, but really one of the things that happens in string theory. Okay. And then, so when you put all that into your kirschel ansatz so this was our kirschel ansatz we end up with, when the dust settles, let's just go back to equation 4.27, that's what you really want to see, is the generalized metric is the background generalized metric, a scalar field, and now two independent vectors LM and LM bar. Okay. Um, okay. And then from this, and this is shown by Kang Hoon Lee, you can get the equations in motion of both in the metric, i.e. Einstein's equations, but then also the B field. And the reason why this works is in usual double copy, where you've got one Young Mills field or one Maxwell field, you can only symmetrize that to get the metric. Having two um, vector fields allows you to symmetrize to get the metric and anti-symmetrize to get the anti-symmetric field, okay? <clears throat> so it's just a really simple thing. One D-dimensional vector, I can symmetrize and get that. I can't anti-symmetrize. Two of them you can. Okay. So ordinary NSNS sector of supergravity, you can contain within two Yang-Mills copies. Now, now we're going to want to do this um, for exceptional field theory. And I'll go through some details. So we're going to assume a flat background. So G mu nu is eta. And in the background, I have no C field. That's for the background. Okay. So then the generalized metric for the background is just this thing. I've written here. The associated null vector will be parameterized by an ordinary four vector and a two form K. And then, um, where are we? Yeah. And then you could introduce a sort of K tilde where you raise or low with epsilon, those things, that's just a convenience. But then the key point is here, the null condition, KM, KM, then becomes this condition on L and K like this, okay? So L and K are not independent. They obey this overall condition. Okay. Um, this is the projector specifically for SL5. This Y tensor, which is part of the SL5 symmetry, construction and grouping variance given by two epsilons. And then you shove all of this into this Kirchhoff Kirschild ansatz. So the projector goes in there, K that you parameterize like this, goes in there with that constraint. 
And then <clears throat> you rewrite, you invert the relation to write the fields that you care about, the metric and the C field in terms of the things in the Kirchhild ansatz. So the Kirchhild ansatz had this L mu and K mu nu, okay, and, and the scalar phi. Now, this is my challenge to you. <clears throat> if I told you, I want you to generalize the Kirchhild ansatz for a space time that includes a C field, what would you do? Would you have come up with this? Because this is what you would need to do. Because when the remarkable thing about this ansatz, remember this is an ansatz for G and C, is it linearizes supergravity. Look at these powers out the front. Look at the complexity of what goes on over here, et cetera. And you know, it's doing that, that thing I mentioned about double field theory, where the B field was the anti-symmetrization of a one form, sorry, of two one forms, two vector potentials, is now that you have the C field is given by an anti-symmetrization of a one form and a two form. If you were gonna, in some sense, factorize 11 dimensional supergravity, what else could you have done? Because you've, you've got a three form. So how can you factorize a three form? It could only be one and two. You can't, yeah, if you see what I mean. Now, <clears throat> to make sure that this is really an extension of the Kirchhoff ansatz and contains the classical solution, after all, you can have pure gravity solutions of 11 dimensional supergravity. All you need to do is set k mu nu equals zero. Okay. That's the additional dimensions. When k mu nu equals zero, because of this null condition at the bottom, that makes l mu nu now null. It's not null normally, but if k mu nu is zero, l mu nu now has to be zero. So now, that vanishes, all these terms vanish and all of these terms with powers become one, okay? There's no C field because K is zero. Well, that's what we said. This goes away as well. Well, this, this recombines, that goes away and then this recombines. And the point here is, is that now you can see this bit that prefactor becomes one, and this is then just e to mu nu, l mu l nu, and then there's a difference of a factor of a third compared to the usual uh, Kirchhoff ansatz, which of course is just a field redefinition of phi. So this is very satisfying, but you know, even if you didn't care about exceptional field theory, even if you did not care about the double copy, but were, was a relativist interested in finding solutions of 11 dimensional supergravity, this is a remarkably powerful ansatz that linearizes supergravity. So to show you how it linearizes, you take this ansatz and you insert it into the equations of motion. And you get this remarkable simplification that this first equation is a Maxwell equation where we identify the Maxwell field as phi L mu. And this is an, uh, a linear equation for a two-form field, B mu nu, or identify that as phi k mu nu. So these are linear. I mean, they're still partial differential equations, et cetera, but these you can solve in terms of harmonic functions with given polarizations. So this is the first hint of a potentially new idea in the double copy that if you want to have a double copy for M theory, <clears throat> you will not get it from just considering Yang Mill's theory alone. At least in the classical double copy, which this is, this is a combination of vector fields. So there's your Yang Mills, if you like, but then the theory of a two form gauge potential. Okay. So, uh, and, and you can see then what that allows you to do is you get things like the three form from a product of those things, okay? 
I, it's hard to know how you go beyond that, but it will be a very interesting question to look at things like factorized scattering amplitudes involving metric in C field in supergravity to see if then there is some structure which involves the tensor product of Yang Mills and B field. Okay, so far that work's not been done. I think Kang Hoon is working on that at the moment. Okay, well that's okay, that's abstract. Let's look at an example. <clears throat> so the most obvious example of a charged object on the C field in lambda dimensional supergravity is the membrane. The membrane is like the electric charge in, in M theory. It's the thing which sources the electric field for associated to C. So this is the solution. This is the 11 dimensional metric. This is the potential for the C field. And it's all given in terms of H, this harmonic function. In order to use the SL5 exceptional field theory, I've got to reduce this down to four dimensions, um, which involves doing a kaluza klein split like this, and then some rescaling. And then in the end, you get this is the internal metric in five dimensions, and this is the C field. Now, the remarkable thing you can check, it, and it is sort of quite, it's a lot of fun when you do this because I was brought up with the membrane and the membrane was sort of a hard object to find solutions of. You, you, you solve these 11 dimensional equations, you use BPS condition and so on. With this Kirchhoff ansatz, I just need to solve these equations and uh, you just get one single harmonic function phi. And then from that single harmonic function phi, using this ansatz, you fill out all this nonlinearity for metric in C field. Okay. So I, I think this is a remarkable result just in the realm of solution generating techniques for supergravity. Now, so what, what, how do you interpret this solution actually? So it's a solution that has a zero is phi. Phi is a harmonic function right? um, that depends on the transverse space, the co-dimension of the brain. And then the, the B field, there's no time component of this. It's one, two. This comes from the fact that the actual membrane sources C zero, one, two. So you may remember, you're making up C out of a product of A and B. Okay. Now, what is B12 that's then only dependent on the transfer of space? Well, that's the field associated to a magnetically charged string that is smeared along the world volume of the membrane. So when I say smeared, what you're doing is Imagine you take a string and then it's magnetically charged and then you move it so that um, you spread it out as a source over the world volume of the membrane. For those of you that have ever done first year electromagnetism, it's like one of those standard things of how you calculate the field of a line of electric charge or a plane of electric charge. It's the same sort of problem. So this is the field associated to a magnetic string smeared along the world on the membrane. And this is a point charge smeared over the plane of a membrane that's electrically charged. So there is this weird thing then. The 11 dimensional theory is a membrane that is charged with respect to the C field. In the single copy, I will call it, it is an electric source smeared over two dimensions and a magnetic string smeared over one dimension. And that gives you the membrane. Um, now, the first thing that you notice about this is, for, for this solution is that the two form and the Maxwell field were both given by the same harmonic function. This is really due to the BPS nature of the solutions. If there was no C field, then you're back in the usual double copy or thing, and you get 
just the single copy given by the Maxwell field. It's the two form that means, so it's the, it's the two form which encodes the C field contribution. The, the fact that it's a BPS object, so BPS remember means that the charge equals the mass or tension. And here, the charge is associated really to the B field. And the fact that charge equals the tension is why we end up with a single harmonic function. So now we've got the potentiality to solve for non-BPS solutions, where I change, I make this phi one from the top and this phi two, so that the electric field and the B field will have different harmonic functions. And that will give us a non-BPS brain. Okay. But that's for future research. Okay. Now um, I have, okay, there's one more slide that's dropped off, but I will, I will say it in words. What I would like people to tell me is in what sense this now is a double copy uh, or single copy. If I was doing this in classical double copy that people have done so far, people would tell me a Schwarzschild black hole is a Coulomb solution. Someone will tell me um, that a Taub nut solution in gravity is a magnetic monopole, et cetera. What I'm telling you now is the fields in, and the objects in M theory, like a membrane, is actually the superposition of a string and an electric charge in a Maxwell theory. But again, this is the evidence that there is. I think there needs to be more. This is done for one exceptional field theory. There's um, work that should be coming through where we do this for the E7. That will allow us to do five brains as well. And it will allow us to look at, because it's greater co-dimension, it will allow us to look at other things too. But I would love someone to do a scattering calculation that would show also this factorization property. So with that, I've finished my talk, uh, maybe even ahead of time, which I'm sure you're all grateful for. Any questions? Um, please oh, go ahead. Um, Ricardo? Yeah, I'm, I'm just, where's my, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Uh, so, so the field contents is the metric diloton and B field and this three form. Uh, no, no, no diloton. Uh, we're in uh, 11 dimensional supergravity originally, so there's no diloton. So it's yeah. just metric and three form. Yeah. Mm. Because in the expressions you wrote, could you write down your, could you show the slide with your NZs for the, for the, this yeah. One. Yeah. This so here, here on the left, this is, I mean, you know, I could get rid of this inverse and the determinant, that's just there to show. But the G mu nu and C are the fields in supergravity, 11 dimensional supergravity. Yeah. And then I've got one scalar field and then these sort of polarization things, L and K. You know, the expression for the for the three form, if you just think about it, let's say linearized, it suggests it's related to a double copy of a gauge field and a, a two -form. form field. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. On, on the other hand, the metric has well, oh, I see. Mm. Yeah, but you see, yeah. you get L's, but then you get oh. this. No, yeah, but yeah, actually, exactly. um, I, well, I guess if we just look at linearized, we can forget about the last term in your inverse metric. Um, okay, so, so um, your metric also has um, a term. Contributions from Just K, quadratic yeah. in K. Yeah. Yeah, that's why I say it's interesting to set K to zero, you get the usual case. And then what you're doing in switching on K is you get this deformation, which tells you, and, and, you, and you know, if it's going to linearize the Einstein equation, you better change the metric if you bring in C, because I'm, I'm going to source curvature, right? So I can't switch on non-trivial C field without 
sourcing some curvature in. Wait, what, what, what is K tilde again? Oh, K tilde is just related to K by epsilon. I don't. I could have put this in terms of ordinary K. Okay. K, K tilde is. Ah, okay. It, it, yeah, this, okay. Yeah, the, yeah. It's just the epsilon we get. It, hmm. It's just to get a representation of SL5, we often use K tilde rather than K, but whatever. Yeah, because actually it does look like a, a double copy of a theory which has the gauge field and the K field, but it looks like a very strange double copy. Exactly. Because the, so the, the graviton is also related to the K field. Exactly. But, th but, this, is, but this is, you know, when Kang Hoon did the, uh, the DFT version of this, you had the same thing in the sense that you had the DFT version would have B here and you'd have like L and a K, but the K would be one index. And the B field would be the anti symmetrization of an L and a one index K. Mm -hmm. But then also Kang Hoon had, you'd have LL and KK as well. Because you get the anti, you get the symmetrization of both things, right? Hmm. So it does follow the same structure as DFT, just an extra index going along. But indeed, and then when you look at the equations of motion, this is the equation of motion of a three form made out of B, and this is the, the Maxwell. Once you do this identification, so as I said, it looks like. This is a double copy where you've got one form and two form. Hmm. So, 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 could you could you go back to your NZ written in terms of generalized quantities rather than the metric and the, and the three? Yeah. Uh, well, is that good enough for you? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, actually, yeah. The, the the other one with the projectors. Yeah, the, this is good. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, this is for DFT. So, when you get these out so the way. yeah, the capital case have both the little l and the little k. Okay, so uh, yeah, you yeah, exactly. So so you do have some kind of left moving. No, but it's not left and right moving. This is crucial because, and and, and this is why you don't expect it in M theory because the just the dimensionality doesn't match. Mu runs from one to four. These together run from one to six, if you like. I mean, so it's four by four by four anti-symmetric, which means six of them. So this is the, the, the story that you see a lot in exceptional field theory, which is you don't, you know, a lot of string theory is built on factorization of left and right. It's double cop, it's sorry, it's double field theory because in some sense it's about the theory of left and right modes. Mm -hmm. People didn't know how to generalize that for a membrane. There's no notion of left and right moving on a membrane. But uh, somehow, the structure that seems to go through is that you have this extension here, as I say, this is six dimensions and four. So it's a four, six factorization. It's not a square root. Yeah, it's quite different because in the other case, Mills fields being boundary fields for the open string. So we can, one of the ways that we think of factorization is that we have, it's related to the open string, the closing of the open string with, and, and we know that we've got vector fields. The open membrane, which is the sort of object in M theory couples to a two form. You just see the fact that an open membrane is a ring as a loop and that couples to a two form. So already open membrane theory has got this notion of a two-form floating. And indeed the field on a phi brain, which is the equivalent of a D brain, where you normally have Young-Mills fields, is a theory of two forms. So it's not that surprising from that point of view, from a boundary point of view, why you would get these two forms appearing. So you, you explain how this reduces to the usual Kirchhild ansatz. Yeah. But does this also is there some kind of reduction to the DFT ansatz? Yeah, yeah, easily. Um, you keep but a, L and L bar independent. Yeah, you keep you keep 
you do a reduction of this big K uh, on a circle, which means you drop L by one and you drop K, the, this new index you fix. And in fact, we even did it in the paper, we reduced to the 2B string. So it's just basically uh, doing a Kaluza Klein reduction of this thing. Because this is like, you know that 11 dimensions, you drop down one, you're in a string theory. In fact, you can drop down two and go to 2B and then get both the string and the D string. So yeah, you just basically dimension and reduce this vector by one dimension. By one dimension would mean one dimension in L and, oh God, this is four by four into symmetric. Three dimensions in this, I think I got it right. But so, sorry, I, I thought in the FTN that the capital K was related to some little L and the, cap, and the capital K bar was related to some L bar. Yeah, but they all, but from this point of view, they would come from L and K. They'll be in L and K. The, but then how, how can you reduce them such that you get L on the left and L bar on the right? Yeah, well, you've got to be a little bit careful because you've also got to reduce this Y. I, I can't do this without a blackboard. Okay. Um, it's in the paper. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. I can show you, I, I can show you, I can show you tomorrow when I'm at Queen Mary, if you like. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've got other questions, maybe. Yeah, I think there's a question from Hunrock. Uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, thanks for a nice talk. Um, so one um, obvious question is, um, if you do this for um, uh, groups other than um, SL5, so um, uh, for example, if you do it for um, uh, SL55, for example, then it would seem like you get a vector field and a two-form field as well as another five-form field. Is that right? I mean, it's a, uh, it's a set of fields that you get just the... Uh, Sorry, say that again. If, if I do it for which again? Uh, say, uh, the, ne the next simplest case, the um, uh, SO55, right? SO55, yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, is, 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 general, is, a, is the expectation that um, uh, you get um, different form fields for each of the generalized um, uh, coordinates? I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so you, what you do is, I, I can tell you what you do. So if I go back to this list here, uh -huh. okay, um, what, I, I, what you should do is add to this list representations of G um, that will associate to you the dimensionality of the space. Um, and then what you do is you break up the dimensionality of that space into representations of the D-dimensional Lorentz group. Right, so I mean, if, so if I'm looking at your review correctly, um, for the, if, for the um, SL55 case, you should get a vector and a two form and a five form, is that right? That's absolutely correct, yeah. Um, yes, so um, so it would seem like, so, so um, depending on um, how many well, directions you um, uh, treat as, um, depending on which exception group you use, I mean, so in, in the D equals five case, um, you would say that single copy consists of a one form and a two form and a five form, as opposed to just yeah. one form. Yeah, exactly. And then the point is you may say, well, the, what does that, what, what does that count in the double copy in the gravitational description? Well, you can now have things which you want to generate C6 mm -hmm. because in 11 dimensional supergravity, you've got C6 and C3. Mm -hmm. And I've been ignoring C6. So you take the five form, tensor product it with the one form to give you C6. I see. Um, so yeah. that will give you the five brain solution. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, and I mean, uh, you also briefly mentioned the relation, possible relations with amplitudes of copy. Um, so I mean, it's a little bit peculiar for the amplitudes, among others, because um, uh, so, so it, it, you you take the in the SL five case, I mean, you take the one form and the two form, and then you um, combine them, anti symmetrize them to get uh, C three, and that's fine. But uh, um, in the if in, from the amplitude point of view, you would usually also expect the parts other than the total anti symmetrization to also enter. Um, and so um, yeah, that's, so that's. Uh, this is not to say that um, this doesn't count as double copy. Um, I think um, it's um, as nice as you know. I mean, usual um, examples of classical double copy. Um, yeah, but um, but if you want to relate it to amplitudes, um, you would need some kind of principle that tells you um, that uh, when you combine polarizations, you should keep certain components and not others. Exactly. So, so I, I just take this as uh, I'm throwing down the gauntlet to to my amplitude colleagues to now construct, the hint is don't try and do it with two copies of Yang Mills, do it with Yang Mills and a two form, and then 
come up with the rules you need to then look at the amplitudes in a one dimensional supergravity. And, and sorry, one, uh, one question is, one quick question is, I mean, does this work for a more gauged supergravity? Um, you, you can, you could get there. I mean, so Kang Hoon has done work involving the heterotic string. And of course that has within it gauge fields, a particular type. I would know how to get the gauge supergravities from these through what's called the Schwartz ansatz. Mm -hmm. I think all that happens is the complexity gets higher. I don't think you get conceptually a bigger problem. So you would still expect a Kerr shield ansatz for a more gauge supergravity? So I do, yes, I do. Yes. Okay, in fact, I, I, I know how to, in fact, maybe I should write the paper. I know how to make one from what I've already done because I know how to move to gauge supergravities from exceptional field theory using what's called a generalized, generalized mm -hmm. start again, generalized Shirk-Schwartz reduction. So I think if I did a generalized Shirk-Schwartz reduction of a generalized Kershield ansatz, I will come up with a generalized Kershield ansatz for gauge supergravity. I see, very nice. I've not done it. I just put the words generalized in the law. <laughs> but there's, there's, it's like, you know, it's two sides of the commutative diagram. You go from exceptional field theory to gauge supergravity is the Shirk-Schwartz reduction that's well understood. And I wrote papers on this now coming up to now eight years ago. And then you've got the Kerr-Shield ansatz, which gives us the thing. And it's just putting those two together and concatenating those maps will give you a Kerr-Shield ansatz for gauge supergravity. Maybe I should write that paper.